So you get to that point where, well, what are those kids doing in those? They're just being politically indoctrinated because there's nothing else, right? Which if you believe in conspiracy theories, you could see the advantage to that if you want to be one of the indoctrinators, if you want to be one of those people. But his premise was, say, I, 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 I never put much credence in conspiracy theories because I don't have much faith in people being able to keep their mouths shut. If it's a genuine conspiracy theory, it requires a lot of people to say nothing. And I've never in my life ever seen a group of human beings that, that where there was preponderance of people who could do that. We're not built that way. But I think now that if I look at modern education, say, well, if, if, if I have a child and I want him to go to the world, what do I want him to know how to do? Well, I want him to know how to understand other people. Like what makes people tick? Mm -hmm. And not just your friends, what makes your enemies tick? You know, you should understand that because maybe they're not your enemies after all. They should learn how to do that. They should learn how to separate the wheat from the chaff in terms of people talking to them. They should be taught body language, like advanced uh, uh, training and reading body language. They should be developing critical fa faculties, all the things that you mentioned before. And they should be doing all that at public school, as far as I'm concerned. They mm -hmm. should learn how to install an electrical socket in your house. They should learn how to pump gas into your car or, or you know, at least fill the tires up with air. And a few years ago, when cars were more were simpler, I would have said they should know how to change the fan bulb, a few other things, but that's gone. That's yeah. Gone. Mm. But practical skills, how, how, to, how to use a checkbook, how to use a bank account, how to calculate how much you can spend and how much you can. One of the things on my list, stuff. one of the ones on my list, Jim, was how to fight with your spouse. Well, <laughs> problem you know, resolute, like how to do that without it going crazy. Well, and that's why I alluded a moment ago to reading people. How do you read yep. people, right? How do you resolve differences without resorting to either screw you and walking away or I'm going to punch you in the nose? Well, yep. those are two fairly effective ways of dealing with a problem at one tiny moment in time. Yep. But beyond that, they're incredibly destructive, both of them. So why are we teaching our kids to do resolution? Why aren't we doing that? I have no idea. I don't I know think... why we're not doing all of these things. But to come back to your ultimate question, yes, I think that based on my own experience, and, and I, I'm no expert, but based on my observation over this many years, I have to believe that had we done that 50 years ago, when they first started moving away from yep. the three R's, if they'd moved in that, I have to believe things would be much better now because sadly, and I talk to friends of mine who think I'm, I'm just an old stick in the mud and, and the end of the world kind of guy, and I'm not at all, but I look around now and I go, it's hard to imagine this domestic life, ordinary individual life, being much less confidence building than it is now. Yeah, we live well in our society uh, uh, in terms of, of products and goods and material things. We live really well. And I don't, I don't denigrate that for a second. I don't downplay the importance of that. But our, our spiritual lives, and I don't mean religion, I just mean getting in touch with ourselves and those around us. Well, most people are walking around in days all the time. And you see that. You see that most recently, uh, uh, if you guys don't mind, I'm going to shift the focus, but just for a very short period of time here, and okay. I don't want to mislead anybody as to what I'm going to say. I noticed in 19, um, excuse me, in 2015, they started talking about this American billionaire who's going to run for president, Donald Trump, of course. I didn't know the guy. I think I maybe saw him on the Tonight Show once, maybe. Uh, I don't know. I kind of vaguely remember that. And he just looked like a you know smarmy rich kid, uh, the kind that I went to high school with a lot of them. And, uh, yeah, okay, whatever. Still fine. But I'm interested. I'm always interested in American presidential politics. The rest of it, not. But just, you know, it's a pretty important job, and it's fun to watch how people get. So I, he had a book called uh, America... <laughs> keep forgetting it, America failing or America something or other. And uh, just a little book. I don't know if he sold very many copies of it, but I was in a bookstore. I thought, I want to find out more about this guy. He's running for president. Well, I read that book and it reminded me of nothing so much as Lee Iacocca's book back in the 80s, 
when Lee was bemoaning the American, the disconnect between American politics and the average American. And in those days, his focus was through cars and the terrible balance to play with Japan and all that. Mm -hmm. Trump's book was repeating the same thing. And I had been a huge fan of Iacocca. And uh, so I read the book with great interest. That, okay, this guy, I started to see him on TV. I didn't like him. Don't think I want to have a beer with him. He's not my kind of guy. He's too bombastic. He's all of those things. Okay, fair enough. Now, here's where people need to set aside their prejudices and just listen for a second, because here's what I'm, the point I want to make. I, uh, uh, had I been an American, I certainly would have voted for him over Hillary Clinton, but I would not have been comfortable doing that. I would have been concerned about my vote, but I think that's probably how I would have voted. Almost immediately post that, that very surprised outcome, he started being called all kinds of things in the, in the mainstream media. Um, he quickly became the world's greatest racist. I went back and did, now this is very early in his career. I went back and dug through reports of him and stuff in his life and his business career. No evidence of that. Did he say some insensitive things once in a while? Yeah, but he also was lauded by every major black organization in the United States was given their highest reward or was given their man of the year dinner or whatever, every single one. Now this goes on through all the other things that people put against him. All, and I don't wanna get into that because I don't care. Uh, but I then, as things went on, you started to see these people show up on television and on social media who were almost literally foaming at the mouth and I'm sitting back as a guy who likes to look at what's going on before I make any, and you know, John, you know me, I, I, don't, I don't have opinions unless I can back them up. If I can't back them up, I don't have an opinion about that. It's I've just, always I, known you to be fair well, and, and that's well the way, thought. Yeah. That's the way I was raised, you know? So if I don't like somebody, I can give you, a or a policy, I can give you a chapter and verse, why not? If I can't give you a chapter and verse, then I don't have an opinion. Don't ask me because I got nothing to share with you. But I watched an entire country split um, with some people, you know, mid left, mid right, going on with their lives. Just, you know, we had another election. Okay, we got another government. But then these people closer to the center with the left and the right. And this absolute insanity started popping up. This is what they now call Trump derangement syndrome. And which a lot of people still laugh at. And let me check from experience. Don't go on Facebook and even refer to that in a, in a, in a technological sense or in a semantic sense. No, you can't do that. But I saw all these people absolutely lose their marbles and say things about this individual that they did not know, that they could not possibly have researched because had they researched as much as I had, they would have found that most of these things were not true or ridiculous exaggerations of the truth. And this went on and on. So again, this isn't about Trump. I'm not talking in favor or against Trump. I'm just saying that here we are in, at that point, 1916, or 2016, 17, 18, 19, 20, and half, not half the population, a big chunk of the population is caught up in either, he's the worst thing in, in the history of the world. I saw a post just yesterday where a guy said, and I quote, uh, Trump combines all the worst things of Stalin, Hitler, Pol Pot, and Mao Zedong, and said yeah. it, I, I assume, you know, it's sincerely. And then you got the people on the other side of that divide that, no, he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. He, there's, you know, he's this, he's that, he's something else. And man, you guys are all morons and idiots. None of these guys are right. The truth is there somewhere, but society, our society, Western society, and I love Canada and the states and together, a lot of people don't like that, but I think in a societal, from a societal point of view, we are much more alike in terms of individuals in society, and then we put it that way. Our societal structures are different, but we're very much alike. And, and it just astounds me how much of that is going on now. People that have not, cannot, I have to think, cannot either figure out how to do this or bring themselves to do this because now they're investing. Trump's my yeah. hero. Well, there's no point talking to you at all anymore because he's not a hero. Trump's the worst politician in the history of the world. Well, no point talking to you either because that's that's ridiculous. That's not even close either. But the most powerful nation in the world is ripped apart because it has a population now with a huge center part of which 
don't know which way's up. They literally don't. They know. They can't think. Crink, they can't think critically. And that's exactly it, Paul. They they either lost that ability, or I think more likely they never had the. Ability. Never had it. Not that. I wasn't. I mean, my dad was a wonderful role model for me and a wonderful mentor, and my mother too. But they never talked to me about critical thinking. They just talked to me about, you know, don't say things you don't believe are true. Don't say things you can't back up. Don't say things you don't mean. And mm -hmm. when you say something, make sure you mean it. And there's a few errors here, here and there, as like we all have. I think I've managed to do that. And so have a lot of the people. A lot of the people, one of my friends of my generation have done that too. So how much that is about our parents and what they instilled in us, I don't know. But now we're stuck at, at a, a, a a place in time where a lot of people that I talk to and follow have taken to, and I have to taken to referring it to it as clown world, because there's no other explanation for what we see going on. This absolute abdication of any responsibility for critical thinking. What was Even that expression that you used, Jim? What was that expression that you used? Cl clown world. It's a clown world we live right. in. Right. You look at what people are doing at every, particularly in government, at every level mm -hmm. um, in Canada and the United States and Europe and the Far East too. Some of the things that are being done, there's no explanation for them other than people are doing these things. They're clowns. They, they're out of touch with reality. Their reality is a, is a red nose and, and pointed ears and paint on the, and they, they don't know what reality is anymore. Well, I think and, they're trying to, they're trying to, promote and uh, they're trying to promote their own uh, need like you need me therefore you know vote for me kind of thing well i think there's a, a great amount of truth to that in the sense we talked before about sort of uh, uh, personal fulfillment personal self-worth you know if you are now as important as any human being who ever lived on the planet and a lot of them believe that and there's one school of thought with which i agree that says that is true that, that we all at one level are equal and equally worthy, but that doesn't extend to everything in everything in all of our lives. It just doesn't. It's not like nature's not like that. No, worthy You're not like that. Worthy and capable are two different things. Well exactly. And so you now you've got all these people that like like the Trump derangement guys, because they're my favorite because they are just so out there. Some of the right wing guys are as much or more out there, but they're not they're not as eloquent, and quite frankly, they're not as funny to me. They, they seem to be more, oh, you poor dumb sap. But the, the other, the guys on the other side, you go, are you, you actually get up in the morning and take that attitude to work with it? You know, I see these guys all the time. I think that, I think that from a, a journalistic standpoint, uh, fairness and balance have, uh, have sort of been discarded. Well, if you talk to, uh, journal. I know lots of journalists. Of course, I was in the business for 25 years. I know lots of broadcast journalists and print journalists. And for the most part, and I'm not going to pretend that I've talked to all of them in the last 10 years about this, because I haven't, but I've talked to several. And there is still, with one exception, one, one of my old friends is, kind of sees it the way I do, which is that um, back in the day, um, there were news reporters and there were commentators and never the twain shall meet. Uh, heaven forfend that a news yep. reporter would ever inject anything personal into a report. Now they did it all the time, but usually they did it kind of unwittingly, you know, because they're just kind of, they leaned one way there and it wasn't very serious. Well, there are no more news reporters out there. Yes. But beyond that, though, beyond that, the most of the, of the, journalists that I'm in touch with would fight you tooth and nail at any suggestion, any suggestion, particularly the ones that are still working, that they're not 100% objective. And it's laughable, because all you have to do is listen to them and go, well, no, you, you, here are the facts as I know them and understand them. And often, here are the facts as you presented them. And now you're drawing a conclusion from those facts that I don't agree with. That's not the conclusion I would draw. But if you, if you say that or engage them one way or another, it's pretty quickly apparent that no, 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 no. This is what I believe. This is what I reported. So this is the truth. Yeah, society, I don't think a society can last um, for an indeterminate length of time without a critical 
faculty without a group of people within it who are not only free to be critical, but are encouraged to be critical based on reality, based on verifiable fact. And that's all gone. I mean, you can't watch, I don't watch network television at all. I don't watch any of them other than maybe here and there, I'll see a little piece. I don't watch them because after 25 years in the biz and, and you know, 50 years entertaining audiences, which has a lot in common with communicating in the media, much more so than many people maybe realize. If you're, and I'm not talking just being a musician, because I was never much of a musician. I, I was always a better entertainer than a musician. But as an entertainer, interacting with an audience, reading an audience, mm -hmm. you learn a lot about human nature. And as you do, if you're paying attention in the in media side of things. So all of these people, or most of these people, and certainly all the guys in the major networks, I'm sure if you got them alone in, in, in an empty room and said, now, do you really believe what you're saying here? I'm sure that most of them would say, well, of course I do. Of course I do, because I, this is what I believe. So of course I did, of course I'm right. Of course you're, you're wrong because you don't agree with me. Well, that's just, that is an incredibly self indulgent and very destructive attitude. Jim, can I ask you, how did you make the transition from rock and roll into into journalism? It, it was it was in 1992, I think that that you started a talk show with CJBK in London, was it? Yeah, it was 90, 91 or 92, 92, I guess. Yes. Well, that, that was How did that come an about? Well, it was an interesting story. Uh, I had been playing for years. My wife and I had gone on the road in the 1980s and had a very successful act playing holiday inns mostly and did that for four, six and a half years and really liked it, but then said, well, it's time to do something else. So let's go home and see what's going on. We did. I decided I wanted to retire, um, not permanently, but retire for a little while. I used to read books about this character named Travis McGee and he was kind of an adventurer. Ah. And uh, uh, you know him, John? Well, both Paul and I are Travis McGee fans. Well, there you go. So, so you know all about Travis. And Travis's thing was, I work hard for a while, I get a few bucks, and I yeah. retire. Yeah, that's because true. when I'm old enough to conventionally retire, maybe I won't be able to. Well, I took that very much to heart. So when we came off the road, we had some had some money, access to some money, and saved some money. And I said to my wife. Uh, I, I'm, I want to retire for a couple of years. I want to build another recording studio. I want to do some stuff and some projects. She said, sure, I don't care. She had a good job and a smart girl. So had a good job, well-paying job. She'd do whatever you want. So I retired from nine to five and I got interested in uh, more in music. And that's when I started doing the jingles and all that kind of stuff. But I ended up doing comedy songs on a local radio show for a guy named Peter Garland, who was the, the, the big morning guy here in the city. Um, Steve Garrison at CJBK was also very, very influential on me personally, great guy. But Peter was more of a more of a jokester, more and had a had a bigger audience, quite frankly, because uh, it was lighter, lighter. You know, Steve could get very involved in things. And God bless him. For was sure. that Peter Garland you meant? Peter Garland had yeah, the morning okay. show at CFPL yeah. for years. And I ended up through a, a series of things not worth talking about. I ended up uh, writing comedy songs for his show, getting paid. I was on the on the radio station, a -Roll, as a songwriter. The only one in the country, as far as we could ever figure mm -hmm. out. The only station and the only songwriter. So I started doing that. And then I realized that uh, there was certain notoriety coming from that. And that I could use that notoriety maybe to affect some things in my uh, community a little bit. So I started looking for places where I could volunteer to do this, that, or the other thing, and where the fact that I was on the radio every day, although it wasn't my own show, but I was being heard, and Peter talked about me a lot on the show, and I visited his show a lot of times, as long as a guest. Uh, and so I, I joined uh, several different city committees, and I also joined the White Oaks Candidate Day Committee thinking that uh, I could maybe be a bit of a liaison with the radio community to that. And it worked very well. Anyway, after one of the meetings there, I got into a very spirited political discussion with one of the other guys. And uh, at the end of the, uh, just for fun, but we actually scared people around the table. People were literally pulling their, pushing their chairs away from the table because they thought we were going to go at it. Well, we weren't at all. We were just having fun. And so he came up to me there and said, you were talking about doing a talk show. 
never thought about doing a talk show. I said, yeah, I'd love to, because Peter was my good friend. His wife, Ann Hutchinson, did the talk show. She, had, you know, she was a good friend too, and, and uh, both incredibly talented people. And uh, I said, yeah, I, I, yeah, but I'll never, I'm 41, 42 years old. I'm never gonna get a job in radio. Why do you ask? Well, he worked at CJBK. And he said, well, we're, send me a resume. So, long story short, they hired me. No experience, nothing. Don't know, I still don't know why they hired me, but they did. And then that led to um, some other things happening that because I was already involved in committees and things and I'd seen how that could work and that had affected my career directly and positively, I looked for more things to do, get involved in more organizations, do this, do that, do something else. And because uh, I'm trying to build a new career here too, and I ended up, again, I ended up, I keep saying that, but uh, next thing you know, I'm approached by the free press uh, because I had been writing a column because I was on the radio, writing a column for a little paper called the Forest City News, a weekly paper. And uh, I loved that. And he had approached me because I was on the radio. He probably thought he'd get some free plugs, which he did. Uh, but the free press approached me, Phil McLeod, and said, uh, we've been watching what you're doing here, and we'd like you to come and write for us. Well, okay. I had no particular training as a writer. I wasn't particularly good in English in school, but I've always been a pretty good talker. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I generally, I can't quote you the rules of grammar, but I would suggest that I know as much as anybody I know about the rules of grammar, although I couldn't quote a single one. And that was from my mother when I was a kid, reading to me, making me read to her, correcting me every time I got something wrong with, with great affection, but correcting me all the time. And I listened and paid attention. So now I'm a writer. And then Business London Magazine approaches me and I've worked for them for almost 25 years. And uh, the London Musicians Association needed some help. So I edited their, their monthly magazine for a while and, and stuff just started to happen like that. There was no, okay, today I'm a musician, tomorrow I'm a writer. There was never that cutoff point. Uh, it, one just flowed from the other. But there are similarities and great differences in it too. One of the frustrations for me as a musician in a recording studio is you, you've got you've got an idea, you've got a voice, you've got some lyrics, you've got the skill to play the instruments, but between that and a finished product that people are going to want to hear, a sonically good, clean, nice, professional sound, that's a long way and a lot of work to make that happen. And you can screw that up, you know, you can mix a song that's going to sound great on the radio, but it's not going to sound good in your car. And uh, when you reach a certain level of expertise, you know how to fix all that. I right. didn't, although I studied it, but I, I never became adept at it. Whereas with writing, once you've put your final words down on the page, and in my case, that's usually, and when I write a book, it's usually seven or eight major drafts before I'm at what I consider to be the last statement, the statement. But once you've got that, there's nothing between you and the audience except your intelligence and theirs. And so that has a sort of pristine element to it that I don't get from music, which is probably why the older I got, the more focused I became on writing than on performing music. And to the point where I've now uh, I just, well, I can't say I finished it. I will finish it in a couple of days. I have to put a couple more pictures in the, in the manuscript before it goes off to the layout people. But I have just finished a 180,000 word book, which is twice as big as anything I've ever written. Um, about in music. addition, sorry. No, that's okay. I was gonna, going to say, but in addition to, to your, your prolific writing, and I want to talk a little bit about your novels, but with regards to the talk show, Talk of the Town, you uh, you got to interview and meet a, lo a lot of people, didn't you? Yes, I certainly did. Yeah, it was, uh, and that was a revelation. Well, not a revelation. I've always been the kind of guy, and I get this from my father, who believed that politicians uh, were certainly no better than the average guy, and in many cases, but significantly worse a a as people. And I don't mean that. To, I don't mean that to insult anyone, but that's. That's what he believed, and quite frankly, that's what I believe too, based on my years of, of uh, doing all the things I've done. So uh, the first time I, I had a chance to interview famous politicians, I found, not to my surprise, but I didn't care. Like, 
you're the prime minister, oh, good for you. Like, you know, what have you done for the country lately? And I don't mean that to be flippant mm -hmm. because I, you know, I wouldn't be flippant like that. I have respect for the offices and so on. But I quickly discovered that politicians as a group are, uh, there's a lot of entertaining going on there. And in many cases, not much thought. And that was borne out by all of the many, many dozens and dozens of politicians from from uh, prime ministers to premiers to uh, uh, American governors to American presidential candidates. I interviewed Steve Forbes several times who had run for, for the office. Um, but they weren't the interesting ones in all but a very few cases. The interesting, the really interesting ones were the ordinary folks with a fascinating story to tell. And I always made sure we had lots of time for them on the show. And uh, authors, I loved authors if they had something to say. So over the protestations of my bosses for well over a decade that I shouldn't be doing this, I would have authors on regularly to talk about their book. I found that they were generally pretty fascinating. Show business people were show business people with a couple of exceptions. They were kind of all about, hey, me, I'm a show business guy. I'm on your show. You should be very grateful. And they would have a little more media training too. Well, they would, but they didn't always use it effectively. I, my my experiences with the with the famous and the you know the, the well known and the famous are not all that positive. Okay. You know the people who the people who influenced me in a in a practical way, um, General Lewis Mackenzie, mm -hmm. the Canadian general. Yes. Um, famous for a lot of stuff. It impressed the heck out of me. I still have tremendous respect for Lee McKenzie. Um, Steve Forbes, I really like talking to Steve Forbes. And he was kind enough. This was after his presidential days, but he was running Forbes magazine, you know, huge uh, business capitalist enterprise. Yes. And he was on my radio and TV show six, seven, eight times. Wow. Just because he liked talking to me. And because my producer, Kathleen Keating, who John will remember well, was an absolute ace at convincing people to come on the air with me. She, but she I, was. Liked him, I liked him not just because it was Steve Forbes, but because he, he had a lot of really interesting down-to-earth stuff to say that you wouldn't necessarily have expected of a guy uh, whose, whose father palled around with Elizabeth Taylor and you know, all of that stuff. He was, he was very inspiring to me and Pierre Burton. Pierre would have the been first, very interesting. The first interview I ever did, well not for the reasons you think though, the first interview I ever did on the radio never got to the radio. Really? I, I worked for, at the station for about three weeks before I went on the air, learning the ropes, the technical ropes and you know figuring out what we were going to do because the boss just said give me a radio show and uh, a talk show. You figure, you figure the rest out. Okay. So I had a chance to interview Pierre about a week before the show started. So we made all the arrangements. He came into the studio and we sat down and he had, I forget what book it was, but I had read some of his book because I'd heard that he was just hell on wheels with announcers who um, were not informed right. about what he had written. Didn't necessarily have to have read the whole book, but you had to have understood him. And I knew by reputation that if you crossed him, he would kill you. He would kill you in public. So uh, I had read as much of his book as I could find time for in the couple of days that I had. I made copious notes. Uh, and here's Pierre Burton, Mr. Burton, welcome to the program. So glad to have you here. Thank you, glad to be here. Uh, now your new book is blah, 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 blah. Yeah, it is, yeah. And I said something, and I'm not sure what it was, but I tried to be a smart ass and say something that would impress Pierre Burton about one of the characters in his book. And uh, I got it wrong. I got the reference wrong. And he leaned back in his chair and just looked at me and said, no, that's not right. And then just sat there, right? Here's where he's gonna kill you in public. So I recovered as quickly as I could and moved on. And we got an interview, but he was very uncooperative because he had no respect for me at this point, right? Mm -hmm. And I hadn't earned his respect. I hadn't done anything that he would respect. It was just the opposite. So end of the interview, thank you, Mr. Burton, blah, 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 blah. And uh, he said, you know, you need to relax a little bit and you need to make sure you know what you're talking about. And then he walked out. 
so after I'm on the air a couple months later, um, he's on, on tour again. He's got another book, maybe three months later. I say to my producer, not Kathleen, uh, I said, he's coming through town. See if, see if he'll come back. I don't think he will. Well, he came back. Oh, and we never played that first interview, by the way. That's never been heard because it was off. Okay. I wouldn't have heard him. He comes back and, and he came in. He says, oh, yes, uh, Jim, how are you? Yeah, good to see you. I didn't notice your name on the Where We've Evolved. Yeah, and I recognize it. It's good shower things. You've only been on for a while. Yeah, how are you doing? I said, well, I don't know. I guess we'll find out. <laughs> we had a wonderful interview. I had read the entire book. I had pulled some key passages out of it that helped illustrate what the book was about and, and you know, why the book was worthwhile reading. And uh, I asked him some good questions and he gave me some good answers and I would follow up, you know, all the things that you should do. And uh, at the end of it, he stood up and shook my hand and, and uh, after the interview was over, he says, boy, you sure improved in three months. You're gonna have a great career. Now, he treated me very badly in that first interview. He could easily have overlooked that, moved on, as most guests would have done, as I would have done if I were a guest. But by not doing that, he changed my broadcasting life. He changed my career because he reinforced the things that I knew, but I guess wasn't paying attention to. You never show up. You never try to upstage your guests. You never, if a guest tells a joke, you never come back with a funnier one. Just all of these very basic rules that if you want any good interviewer, will follow all these rules. And when you know what they are, you, you see them doing it. But if you don't know what they are, you don't even notice. It's just, gee, that's a good interview. He was a good interview. He asked all the questions. Got a lot of good answers. There are some people who say that the best interview, the best interviews are those where the interviewer hardly speaks at all. I don't believe that. That wasn't true for me, but for some people, yes. I think the best interviewers or the best interviews are those that sound like two people who um, have some level of respect for each other. They don't have to like each other because I've had great interviews with people I couldn't stand. Okay. Uh, and, and probably vice versa. But the, inter the best interview is one that sounds like a conversation. Sure. Mm -hmm. You're just having a conversation with this person. And right. you're knowledgeable enough and they're knowledgeable enough to make the conversation interesting about whatever it is. And that at the end of the interview, people are, you hope, at home going, geez, I hope he has him back on again. Mm -hmm. And so that was always in the back of my mind. You need, you need to make your guests at home feel at home. Mm -hmm. You don't need to make them look good. That's a mistake, I think, that a lot of interviewers make. And you can see that. They kind of fawn on their guests and I did that once or twice with guests who just, I thought were amazing, but hard, I just, I tried so hard never to do that. And uh, if you can make that happen, oh, and the other thing is throw your questions away, right? I never had questions. I would write out questions the night before, I'd go over them in my mind, but when I sat in there with the, whoever the guest was, the questions were in the garbage can. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. con you don't have questions in a normal conversation. I mean, you the questions pop into your head, right? Right. Maybe you remember them from the night before, but you, you're not, when I'm talking to you, I'm not looking at it. Okay, okay. That's not a conversation. Okay. So I think if you do that, I think you'll, you'll be okay. I mean, I never, I never made the big time. I never got the call to go to Toronto or New York or Los Angeles uh, and be a talk show host. And, and certainly most of the people in those cities who became very well known started like I did, started at a small station. But that was never my criteria. That was never my goal. I didn't want to, I had a kind of opportunity to go to Toronto once and I didn't even think about it. I said, no, I'm not leaving London. Why would I leave London? This is what I want to be. And that, that's also part of it. I think that you, you, know, you set your goals for what you want, not for what society says you should want or your mother said or whatever. You said what you want. But yeah, if you can do that, if you can just have that, uh, uh, keep it a conversation, even if it gets testy, Keep it a conversation. I had a, a real major blow up with Mike Harris when he was the premier about um, medical care in London, particularly. And it's, I won't go into the story, but anyway, the government had made some pretty major decisions about healthcare in London that were predicated on, uh, not on facts. I don't know what they were predicated on, but not the facts of the matter. And I got him on the show and I ambushed him a little bit. I told him I was going to talk about healthcare. I didn't tell him exactly what, but I wasn't obliged to anyway. To tell them exactly what. 
And I raised this issue that the funding, some funding had been cut to London, to the London area for doctors because there were too many doctors here. And I said, well, uh, if you look on the, the registry for London, I don't remember what the exact numbers were now, but something like, okay, we have this many doctors and this many, more than a third, uh, are professors at Western. Uh, not, they're not all even medical doctors, but many of them are, but they don't practice. They don't have a practice in them. Well, he he had never heard of that. He had no idea about any of that. And and but he was a bit of a bluffer at the best of times. So he's trying to blah, 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 blah. and uh, I just I held his feet to the fire, and things got really testy to the point that for three years he would not come back on and do my show. But I remember, right? Yep. They also changed that. It wasn't legislation, but they changed the rules and modified the funding and fixed what had been wrong. So I was figured I did the right thing. And Kathleen eventually prevailed on him to come back on, but he was very, you know, was not happy to be there. And I wasn't that happy to have him there. I, I, I didn't, at that point, I didn't have a lot of respect left for him, although I had a lot when we started. But anyway, so that's another example. Even though we had a, a very contentious time, I think if I could find that, I probably got it somewhere. I'm sure that that was a fairly compelling idea. It would have been a compelling idea. Uh, you and John mentioned a little earlier that, that you were very driven and, and hardworking. Yeah, and yeah. it was, I've read your book, Come Back to Life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I sort of know what led up to, uh, to your, your first death. And uh, I'm wondering, do you mind sharing a little bit about that? Well, it's, it's a long story. And I've, I've already chewed your ears off so far longer than it's probably wise. But I'll, I'll summarize it as quickly as I can. Um, I was, and still am to a certain extent, a very uh, type A personality, although I've learned to modify it. But in those days, because the only thing I ever had going for me in a career or trying to get a career was what I could bring to the table. So I had to work as hard as it took to prepare for whatever the job was. And I believed that down in my soul. That's again, how I was raised. That's what my father had taught me that had whatever success I had in life to that point had all been built on. I was willing to work harder than the guy beside me or smarter, hopefully sometimes. So I was just go, go, go. And, and I alluded before to getting involved with community groups and so on, trying to help in my community. And I thought that was very important. So I'd work you know, I'd work a full day. I'd be on the air for three hours in the morning and I'd spend another four hours prepping for the next day. And then I'd go out to some kind of a banquet and then I'd go to a special event and something. And I would do that five, six, sometimes seven days a week, not on air seven days, but out doing things. There were long stretches of time where I was never home for supper and never home till late in the evening because it was just lots to do. And on the radio show, particularly thanks to, to Pierre Burton, I always wanted to be 100% prepared to understand what was going on. And uh, so you just push, 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 push. And uh, I turned 50 and decided I was in terrible physical shape. And if I wanted to get much older, I better get in shape. So I started going to the gym and I did that for about six months and lost a bunch of weight and got very healthy and all this. And then uh, I had a, I had an incident at the gym. I had a heart incident, had a heart attack at the gym. And uh, they scooted me out to the hospital. And uh, I died in the, uh, in the ER. Uh, kind of suddenly they were, I was actually talking to the doctor. And uh, I just went out, gone. And found out some of this after. But, uh, so they paddled on me for a while and gave up, according to the story I was told. And uh, there was one young nurse there who said some version of oh let's let's try once more please doctor can we try once more my mother listens to him every day on the radio some you know some corny thing like that but apparently that's actually what happened and so they zapped me one more time and brought me back so during that period i had a what they refer to as a near-death experience i i think it was more appropriately named an after-death experience but i'm yeah. not going to fight over that I was thinking too, near death experience isn't really quite the right expression, but that's what, you know, that's the expression that people use. Exactly. They... That's, I forget who coined that. It was a well known guy coined that back in the 60s, but 
I always thought, you know, near death experience suggests that you got right up to the edge and then you backed away. Like you got yeah, near, right? Well, <laughs> That's every day for guys our age. Well, I, and to a certain extent, ain't that true? Yeah. Yeah. But so I, anyway, I had an experience and I didn't know what to make of it. I wasn't a religious guy and it wasn't a particularly religious experience, but I went somewhere else while I was out, while my heart was stopped and my brain activity had stopped. So clinically dead, I guess, I, I, mean, I don't know, I wouldn't argue about that, I don't think it matters, but um, I left this reality and moved to another very profound reality that certainly seemed real to me. And I saw some things there and I saw lights and tunnels and you know a lot of those things that are part of that story. There are lots of other things I didn't see. I didn't see any other worldly beings or anything like that, but I did experience uh, uh, and, and this is going to sound corny, but it's the only way I can say it because I don't know how else to have it make any sense. I had a, I went through a period of several minutes where it felt like I was communing with the universe, that I was part of the universe, that I understood not in a, oh yeah, uh, two plus two equals four, not that kind of understanding, but just kind of a very deep-seated emotional understanding of the, the, the reality, the continuity of life, and then it goes way beyond what we the three of us sitting here now look around it. Well, this is life right now. Yeah, it is, but it's not the only one. Right? And uh, I came through that and was awakened um, rather rudely, actually. I, was, uh, I had been there for several minutes standing on this edge of this hill and looking down the hill and there was a stream down there and I saw the stream. And uh, I'd been waiting for some time for somebody to come and tell me what was going on. And I was quite uh, convinced at that time that I had died. And uh, it's a funny trick that a lot of journalists use this trick. And I've talked talk to many people since this to do the same thing. If you're in a situation where you want to start making notes, but you can't do it, you don't have a pencil, you don't have a recorder, it's not the appropriate thing to do, but you want to remember, you really want to remember. Well, the trick that I use, although I'm not as good at it as these, is I write it in my mind. You know, the part of my mind, I might be talking to you and so on, but there's a place back there where I can like, literally physically see myself writing on a piece of paper and I can see what I'm writing. So all through this experience, and I had started doing that as soon as I got in the ambulance, I'd started to write these notes down because you know, your memory is a very tricky thing and uh, what you think you remember and all of that stuff. So I started writing it down and I wrote down all through the period after my heart stopped. I wrote all those notes down too. And as soon after I uh, recovered, which was a couple of weeks before I could do it, I transcribed those mental notes onto my computer. So I had a, what I thought was a pretty good record of what had actually happened. And as my memory changed things over the years, as it inevitably would do, I could always go back to those, that first set of notes and that's what happened. So at, the, at those first set of notes, I was walking across this field and a face appeared right in front of me, a young woman's face. And I stopped, I was quite startled and because I'd been in, talking to myself saying like, well, what do I do now? Okay, I'm dead, I guess. Uh, you know, I stood here for a while, I communed with the universe. Uh, okay, now what? And so it's still a very, human story, right? There's still a human being here. I'm not some whatever. I'm still me in that sense. And this young girl stopped and I thought, oh, this must be an angel. She's sent to take me because that's my cultural reference points, right? You know, beautiful yep. young woman, when you're dead, it's an angel. Uh, and no body, just her face and just covered in front of me. And she looked at me for a second and I'm kind of, okay, well, what do we do now? And then she yelled at me and said, Mr. Chapman, can you hear me? Are you in there? It seemed like a very strange thing for an angel to say. And I blinked. And when my eyes opened from the blink, I was back in the ER. And the face was still there. It was a young nurse that they had been giving a wake him up. And I believe, well, I didn't write this down at the time and I've lost track with her. I believe that she was the same one who'd said, hit him one more time. I think that was part of the story. But anyway, it doesn't matter. And I was back and uh, having experienced all of this stuff. And then I had, a, I got very, very ill. I was already very, very ill. They thought they were gonna lose me for several days. I had another heart attack. And, uh, but anyway, here, I'm still here now. It was a singular experience. Writing the book was a, 
wasn't my first book, but it was, it's the only book I've ever written that I, I'm not sure I can say I wrote the book. And I don't mean to sound goofy, but all of my other books started as an idea, with some words, a little bit on paper, you build, you build, you build, you throw that away, you add this, you do all of this stuff. Um, and it takes a long time. That book, Come Back to Life, took me, and I'm going to say I did six or seven hours a day. It took me about three months to go from first word on paper to finish, ready for the publishing, which is a ridiculously short period, especially for the way I write, because I write, I rewrite, I edit, I rewrite, I write, I edit some more, I throw stuff away. And uh, it's that book just almost as fast as I could type, because I'm a one finger typer, which is why it took me three months. That book just came out and went on the page. So if I could I, say something about it, uh, Jim, ha having read it, that not only is your description in the book of, of the near-death experience and the resuscitation, not, not only is that that, that profound, you, you called it a profound experience, but it was, it was your analysis of it afterwards. It went on for pages and pages and pages. Mm -hmm. and, and I found that to be uh, very inspirational, very, very fair, very open, very honest, and, and uh, worth the price of the book. And actually, speaking of the price of the book, it's, I got the Kindle version, and it's, it's, it's too cheap. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very kind. I, I guess the, uh, I was very aware of doing that, but here's why there was a reason why, because I had no expectation of NDEs. I didn't know much about them, but what little I knew, what little experience I'd had reading about them, I, I'd kind of dismissed and thought something like the RT parts and stuff, you know. I don't, yeah. So when it actually happened to me, I was faced with this necessity of trying to trying to figure out what it meant. Yeah. Because I didn't know. And I said there was no, and you know from reading the book, there was no religious component there. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't hang this on my religious beliefs. I mean, I've been raised in the in the in the uh, United Church at a time where it was pretty loosey goosey <laughs> creed, you know, it was pretty, all, pretty much everything goes. And uh, I lived in a house that was a church going house, but my mother was very much a pragmatist about things. And so I, I didn't grow up kind of weighed down by all of that stuff. Uh, and I don't say that in a bad way, but just I didn't. So when I got out in the world, I, formed my opinions by what I could observe, what I could research. And religion never played a big part in that. Although fear of dying did, as the book says, for many years, I had a profound fear of dying and that affected me in many ways. But once this all happened, that went away. And so I needed to make some sense of it. And that's why there is so much in there of, I don't know if it's analysis, but so much of my commentary about what it meant to me. I never, I've never tried to explain that experience. Uh, and there are lots of people who do, lots of scientists who devoted their lives to trying to explain it. I never saw the value in, for me in trying to explain anything other than explain what had happened, right? Mm -hmm. Here's what happened. And you'll know from the book that I say several times in there in several ways, uh, I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything. You, know, you draw from this whatever you will. But yeah, I is, used. Sorry, I used the word analysis, but I think your word commentary is is more accurate. Yeah, well, it was an analysis, though. I was analyzing. You yeah. were wrong, but but I, I wasn't trying to. I wasn't trying to make sense of it in a scientific way, because I'm not a scientist. I was trying to make sense of it as a as a person who had no expectation of something like that ever happening didn't know anybody at that point. I found out I knew a lot of people who'd been through that, but who wouldn't talk. Um, so I had to kind of try to figure it out. And at the end, there's a number of little um, lessons learned, I call them, as you know, that just here's what I learned from this about this, and I learned about this, and I learned about it, put them all in there. And to me, that was ultimately was kind of the, the value of it. Plus, you lose the fear of dying, you lose the fear of a lot of things. And you find, I found, and I know from reading lots of people since then that there's a, it's very common 
for people to become more open, more emotionally open, more understanding and forgiving of other people. And that certainly happened for me in a big way. My life really changed. I don't know whether people around me were ever aware of how much I changed that way. I know my wife was, but I, I, but I did change very profoundly. And uh, it, was, it was quite an experience. As was, I say, writing the book, it just poof, there it was. And then we promoted the, the book for a few years and sold some copies and had some wonderful responses to it. And uh, um, I think that's probably the most satisfying thing I've ever done in my life was writing that book. And then after that, talking to people who had found something in it. And I mentioned earlier about people that I, I knew who had had near death experiences and wouldn't talk about it. I cannot tell you how many times, because it would be dozens and dozens of times when I would go out to do speaking engagements, which I did for two or three years. I went to Seattle for one and went to Dallas, Texas and New York and a bunch of places to speak at big conferences and in a lot of local churches and groups. I lost track of the number of times people come up to me afterwards and said very quietly, you know, I had the same thing happen to me, but I didn't want to tell anybody because they'd think I was crazy. And I'm so pleased that you came and talked today because you're not crazy, obviously. And it happened to you. I had a minister after after one of these things. The minister took me aside and I knew him slightly. He said, I really need to talk to you. Can you stay around after this? And it was a little lunch. Can you stay after? Yeah, so I stayed. We ended up in his study and he had had a very profound heart stopping, you know, dead on the pavement experience. And had, when he awakened again, awoke again, uh, he was terrified to tell anybody because he was a minister and it had not been a religious, like Jesus did not show up in there and God didn't show up per se. And uh, there were no angels. And, and he thought people will genuinely think, A, either I'm crazy or I have no business being a minister. If I died and didn't see God, then what kind of minister? And, and so we talked some more. And eventually he told his congregation a couple of weeks later and called me and said, that's the most, what's the word he used? Not relieving, not freeing, but a word like that, liberating. It's one of the most liberating things I believe was to tell my congregation. And what happened? Well, nothing. Lots of people come up and said they'd had the same experience. So that's been a huge part of that whole experience for me too, is, is people, other people maybe coming to some kind of an understanding about themselves, not about me. But I'm, I, I just a guy it happened to and knew how to write it down. There was nothing special about me. But, Jim, I read the book uh, when it first came out. So I, that was a while ago. And I'm very likely would commit a Burton faux pas here if I <laughs> dug too deep here. But uh, what I do recall and what you mentioned about that sense of a connection with the universe, yeah. that strikes me as uh, something that I've read uh, more frequently now, and particularly in the last five years, yeah. about the experience with ayahuasca or DMT. Do you know yes. what I'm talking about there? I is do, I do. And I can't, I can't make any... Uh, intelligent comment about any of that because for the reason I said before I don't know I don't have an opinion about it um, because I don't know enough. I will tell you however um, a couple of things that may be pertinent to, to, to external stimulants leading to the same kind of yes feeling um, I have no idea scientifically or otherwise what happened to me I, I really don't I, I know some of the theories but I don't know because I don't know I was in no point or place to judge to judge them then uh, and I don't have the knowledge to judge them now but I will say this I did um, several years later go to the University of Sudbury where a doctor whose name escapes me is most things these days very well known doctor in uh, doing research into um, oh no I've forgotten that too anyway a, a, a ketamine ketamine that was being experimented with all around the world. And he had a theory, he'd created this helmet that uh, uh, with electric thingies in it that both stimulated and recorded your brain waves. And so I was invited by uh, Discovery Channel to go up there and be part of a TV program, which they ultimately broadcast years ago. I don't have a copy, I wish I had a copy. But uh, I went up there and he had a lady there and she had uh, all kinds of, uh, experiences again 
with the helmet on and she was an artist and she drew a whole bunch of very scary pictures and stuff. I sat there for 30 minutes, fell asleep, woke up, yeah, okay, whatever. No, no comparison. No, it, it was an experience. I don't want to say that I didn't fall asleep because I was bored or maybe I was, but I did fall asleep. And uh, anyway, so, so that avenue, and he said himself, he says, yeah, there's, I get people in here that I know, like yourself, I have no doubt that you had a genuine, you know, not only is it catalog, but he interviewed me, so I have no doubt that what the experience, but there are many people that this works on, that it works on, you know, uh, stimulates a similar experience for those of us people that don't. So that, that's the one half of my comment about other stimuli. The other half would be a discussion I had with a fellow who used to was the head of the, uh, and I won't get the title right, but the Brain Research uh, something or other at the University of, of, uh, of uh, Calgary. Or I like him. Anyway, he was uh, he was the head of the of the neurophysiology brain research at some big big uh, university in Western Canada. And I met him through a friend, and we had a very pleasant afternoon. He wanted to hear my story, and. So we went and was invited to his house and we had a glass of wine and we sat and for a couple of hours and I told him everything I could remember. And, uh, and uh, he said to me, not verbatim, but this is just at the end of it, he said, well, you understand that there are a lot of people who believe that what you experienced was just a breakdown of the chemicals in your, in your brain. I said, I'm oversimplifying, but that's, you know, the chemicals break down and promote hallucinations and there's issues about your, the things that you see that, with your eyes and the neurology of your eye. I said, yeah, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm sure of all that. I don't have any question about that. And he said, you, you're, you still stick to your story? And I said, well, it's not a story. I mean, it, in the sense that I made it up, but, uh, I stick to my recitation of what I remember. Oh, interesting. So you, why would you, why would you resist the idea that this is simply a chemical breakdown? It's a, it's a straightforward explanation of what happens. And by this time, now this is 15 years after I had mine, um, now the floodgates have opened with the improvements in modern cardiology and, 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 and uh, cardiac surgery. They're saving millions of people that would have died 20, 30 years ago from heart attack. And I mean millions. Many of those people are coming back reporting their death experiences. So he said, you knew that I said, yes, I was aware of that. And he said, well, so this theory explains all of that pretty neatly, don't you think? And I had to think about it for a minute. And I said, well, here's what I don't understand that if, if that's correct, um, those chemicals that break down, uh, can they be recombined? What do you mean? I said, well, if they break down, can they come back together in the same place? In my mind, no. No, that's basic basic chemistry. No, once they've broken down in their constituent, they're not going to be fun. Oh, okay, well, that's interesting. Well, when I was talking to the doctor, when I actually had the, when my heart stopped, when I had the arrest, I was having a conversation with my doctor. A, a regular conversation. I was, they had drugged me up with the things they give you, but I was still lucid and was talking and talking to the nurses to talk to my wife, and then I was gone. When I woke up again, when that young girl yelled at me, are you in there? And I opened my eyes. The doctor was right there and leaned over and said, Mr. Chapman, how do you feel? I said, well, I don't feel very good, doctor, to tell you the truth. But, you know, we're talking. We're having a communication. And uh, he said, do you, do you know what's happened? I said, yes. I, I assume I arrested and I went somewhere else and now I'm back. Oh. Okay, and we talked for a minute, minute and a half. After all of this was done, book was written and everything, I gave a talk at his church, which incidentally is right next door to my house. Um, although we didn't attend there, but I was invited to speak. And he came up to me afterwards and said, you know, I've never heard your story before. I, I knew you had a book, but I hadn't read your book. He said, I, I'm absolutely fascinated by it. He said, I'll tell you one thing. Um, one thing I remember about you, a couple of things I remember is I knew who you were and you were a radio guy. A couple of things I remember, the thing I remember most was that when you came back, consciousness, uh, he said, almost every patient I've ever had, he didn't say every, almost every patient I've ever had, when they were resuscitated like that, were deeply confused. 
They didn't know where they were, didn't know who they were, didn't know what had happened, as you would expect. They, you know, they've been dead, they've been clinically dead. And uh, he said, you, the minute your eyes opened and you saw me, you started talking to me and you had a conversation for a couple of minutes and you were totally rational and lucid. And uh, he said, I've never forgotten that, it was amazing. So I said to the professor then, if in fact all that stuff is caused by chemicals breaking down and you say they cannot recombine in that context, what happened there? Yeah. And he just, he smiled, as they would say in the book, he smiled knowingly at me. He said, that's a really good point. So that's all I can say about the potential other influences or even internal influences. I don't know. Is it possible that that connectedness experience is not limited to NDEs. I, I think it's not only possible, I think it's very likely there's probably a number of different ways you can reach that, whatever that is. Um, but I say that with confidence, but not with any particular knowledge or any way to prove that it's true. But it just seems to me it's more likely than not likely that there is more to life than meets the eye. One of the hypotheses is that DMT is secreted in the pineal gland in the brain. And so um, that it may be triggered at a life-ending event. And then, of course, if you come back, those chemicals, they may not come back together, but they, they build yeah. up again. But I'd be more interested, and in, in your experience with talking to people, is with all due respect to that doctor, could you look at the experiences of the individuals who've gone through it so he wants to explain it chemically, but the actual way it manifests in their, what they visualize, mm -hmm. are there enough parallels that, you know, you'd think it'd be very unique to the individual, but did no, you? No, the, the, the parallels are overwhelming. So that, not, that, that would be my argument there. Yeah, that something there, not in every case, though. Um, right. The, kind of this, there's a handful of standard things, and I don't want to say what the number is because I'll forget one. But there's the out-of-body experience where you see yourself, you're floating over yourself while the doctors are working on you. That's very common. There's the uh, bright light and tunnel where you go down a tunnel towards a bright light. There's the seeing your deceased relatives, uh, seeing someone who has of some religious significance to you, whether it's Jesus or God or Muhammad or, or whomever. Um, those are pretty widespread, but not everybody has them. Um, more common would be combinations of those. In my case, um, I saw my family, but they weren't dead. They were all still alive. It was all my family that was still alive. Right. And they were looking sort of just sort of past me and all looked very distressed. And obviously I had died and they knew it. And they, they were all at the hospital. Um, and I, at some level, I knew they were there, but that was the first thing I saw. And then they kind of disappeared. And then I saw this landscape and I felt the breeze and I saw the sun and, you know, all of that stuff. I never saw the out of body thing. That was not part of my experience. Um, I didn't see uh, any religious figures. And I'll tell you a story about that in just a second. I didn't see any religious figures. Likely, I would think, because I'm not a religious guy, right? I wouldn't have expected to see that. And uh, if, if I can put it that way, but um, the one thing that I did see was the bright light. And this was after I had stood there for, I would have guessed 15 minutes. In actual fact, it was three or four or whatever it was, nothing like 15, but it seemed like time ran at a different pace at that. But I, and I mentioned before being frustrated, not knowing what to do. Like, what do I, I'm dead, what do I, do I stand here forever? And I remember very clearly, and I wrote in my notes that, that I, I said that, do I stand here forever? And then I thought, oh, that was maybe a bad choice of words. <laughs> For, I'm dead, I stand here forever, okay. Um, what about tunnels? And I remember looking around and it's like kind of a hillside. Maybe there's a cave, which no, no. And then the, the, hill, the, the hill slopes up on the far side. And past this this uh, uh, stream, and I looked up and I saw bright lights on the top of the hill at the far side, and I thought, okay, go towards the light. I know that much. That's what you read and you hear. And so and that's why I walked down the hill and came face to face with this with my angel, and that was that. But the number of people who have uh, experienced some or all of those things is to me quite remarkable. It's not that you might expect that. Or maybe you wouldn't expect, I, know, I might expect, as you said, that everybody's situation, everybody's experience is going to be very unique 
but that doesn't seem to be the case in, in my experience of talking to other people who've been through that. There's a lot of commonalities there. But the religious one has always fascinated me. Why didn't, when so many people will see a real angel or what they take to be, not just a face, but you know, they saw an angel, they saw their dead grandmother, they saw Jesus, uh, they saw some manifestation of God, or they saw an archangel, whatever they saw, but there's a lot of that. And, and I wondered about that. And uh, I still, the best thing I can say is I think it's because I had no religious expectation. Mm -hmm. But I spoke at a church in London years ago and uh, told my story. And usually when I would go for one of these deals, they'd have a little luncheon afterwards and you could meet the people and all that sort of stuff. And this lady came up to me and she said, uh, uh, that was quite a story you told. I said, well, my story. Uh, so is that what would happen? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't be here otherwise. I wouldn't come here and tell you something I made up. Oh. She said, uh, you didn't see Jesus. I said, no, I, I told you what I saw. Oh. She said, well, I died. I saw Jesus. You didn't see Jesus? I said, no, I'm sorry. I just, I told you what happened. And she went, well, and turned around and walked away. You can even be one-upped in death. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I didn't make the grave. Even dead, I didn't make the grave with her. Anyway. <laughs> uh.